and you'll be able to listen to the interpreters. From my side here at the Hanover Messe 2024, welcome at the Tech Transfer Conference stage. We have so many exciting topics here at our stage, which we want to present you. And now we are going to talk about generative AI from hype to hyper transformation. I'd like to know from you, who of you does work with uh, JetGPT or other AI on a daily base or for the daily life? You can raise your hand. Okay, a lot of people, I guess so. So it's more than just classification or optimization. This field is growing so much. And in the next 20 minutes, we, or more or less Tommy Falkowski from the Fraunhofer IEM, wants to show you how you can not only use uh, AI for your daily base, but also add value to your business. So how does that work? He will explain it to us. Well, we want welcome to Tommy Falkowski. Yes, hello and uh, welcome from my side. My name is Tommy. I'm a research associate at the Fraunhofer IEM in Paderborn, Germany. And today I would like to tell you a little bit about generative AI and what's been happening for the last roughly 15 months. Um, I have a short introduction from Sam Altman, uh, the head of OpenAI. He said the following a couple of days ago. In some sense, one of the most important decisions we ever made was this one. And that includes things like deploying ChatGPT into the world and getting the world to take advanced AI seriously, which we tried to talk about for a long time and it didn't really work. And, you know, deploying that really did. At the Fraunhofer IEM, uh, we've been working um, with AI for a long time now. So our institute is over 10 years old and many of our projects have always included AI algorithms. But what we uh, have been experiencing for the last 15 months is something unheard of. So if I wanted to describe the last two years of my life in two pictures, I would use these two. ChatGPT merged, and then it was acceleration from that point on. What happened? When ChatGPT merged, it took just uh, five days, and there were already a million active users. After two months, ChatGPT already had 100 million active users. So it was the fastest growing platform, so to speak, ever. Nobody had heard of OpenAI before. I mean, most of us hadn't. Some might, but it was roughly unknown before. Now, everyone knows about ChatGPT. Most of us have tried ChatGPT and know and have experienced what a uh, uh, paradigm change that has brought to, to us. Suddenly, we are able to interact with computers in natural language in ways that weren't just possible before. We know about uh, Alexa, we know about Google Home, we know about Siri, but they were all always very limited. But now, suddenly, I was able to converse in natural language with a computer. It was able to parse complex questions and give me very complex answers. And since then, the field of AI has seen something of a revolution. A lot of different organizations are working on developing new models in the realm of artificial intelligence. The number of patents has skyrocketed in the last couple of years. But how does ChatGPT work and why does it work so well? And that is actually a question that can be answered very simply. So. I'm going to try to explain the primary working me mechanisms of such models, of such large language models, uh, such as the GPT model that is the basis for ChatGPT. This large language model, it was trained to do one thing, next token prediction or next word prediction, we can imagine. So you have an input sentence and the model can then calculate the probability for the next token that is to follow this sentence. It then, it, it then selects the token or the word, takes this new sentence and calculates the next token again. So it's just putting one token or one word behind the next. This is of course a very simplified version or a very simplified explanation of the working mechanism. 
There's a very, very good video on YouTube uh, that I can recommend to you. I have a short uh, clip that explains it much better than I could ever. The operations in both of these blocks look like a giant pile of matrix multiplications. And our primary job is going to be to understand how to read the underlying matrices. I'm glossing over some details about some normalization steps that happen in between, but this is, after all, a high-level preview. After that, the process essentially repeats. You go back and forth between attention blocks and multilayer perceptron blocks, until at the very end, the hope is that all of the essential meaning of the passage has somehow been baked into the very last vector in the sequence. We then perform a certain operation on that last vector that produces a probability distribution. So as you can see, it's uh, a large number of calculations that is conducted to actually calculate the probability for the next token. And uh, there are many mechanisms that help improving the quality of the output. But I haven't yet heard a very, very good answer why this works as well as it does. One partial answer is scale. What they did is they used vast amounts of data to train these models. This is uh, a graph that shows uh, some of the parameters used for the GPT-3 model, which is the predecessor of GPT or, or, or ChatGPT. Imagine taking 45 terabytes of text data crawled from the internet, from books, Wikipedia, put that through a large neural network with 175 billion parameters, and then train it on uh, the best hardware you can find. If you were to train such a model on a, on a laptop, it would take you almost 100,000 years. At the end, you get a file. You get a file, which is the, the model, the large language model. You put that through a computer program, which might be a second file, and then you're able to uh, summarize documents, uh, analyze correlations. You can also write programming code, for example. Uh, basically, it can learn any language that you put into it. And if we talk about generative AI, we don't o only talk about text. We are talking about multimodality. And this is something uh, that is a trend, and most models that are currently in development and some of the models that are pu publicly uh, available are already multimodal models, which means you can input anything, for example, videos, images, programming code, and you can output another thing. And uh, the way that I actually got curious about generative AI was when I stumbled um, on this article, which said that it was two years ago, and it said that now it's possible to fake any photo with a click of a button. So I did the most obvious thing a re researcher would do. I retrained a model with my own pictures, 20 of my pictures, and I was able to generate myself, fake pictures of myself in any way imaginable. And this, of course, can be used for marketing purposes. We use it, for example, in social media to get, uh, get some attraction. But this opens up so many possibilities. For example, take this sketch that I did a couple of years ago uh, when I was building my house for a cabinet. I can take this image and I can put it through such a generative model and generate what looks like a 3D render image with a click of a button and a little text. And I can do that again and again, meaning that I could iterate over variations of the same object so much faster than what was possible before which opens up new possibilities for ideation, design concepts, trying out different ideas. And you could do that with a car, for example. We also have models that can generate 3D models from text input. And if you think about that, it's not yet good enough to be used in manufacturing, for example. But who knows what might be possible in the next year? Maybe we'll, we'll have text to CAD models by then. We also have text to video models. And what you can see here is roughly a year old. So it was still very notab noticeable that these videos aren't, aren't real. But Adobe a few days ago presented how they will incorporate AI these models into, the, into their software. Currently in early research, generating B-roll for any scene. Through simple text prompts, Sora creates variations for you to choose from.
Two years ago, nobody heard of generative AI, and now we have that in pro productive software already. And think about all the software that you use daily for your work. You will see the in in uh, introduction of generative AI in almost every step of your workflow. And of course, the question then is, will AI automate all of our jobs? I don't have the definitive answer to that, but what I do know is that AI definitely will help us be more productive, be faster at our work, and also can increase um, the enjoyment that we have while working. Because now everything that is tedious and takes a lot of time usually, but is not the core of our value creation process, could be automated through the use of artificial intelligence. And I hope that by combining human creativity and human ideas with the efficiency of artificial intelligence, we will be able to get so much more done. And that also means doing stuff in the physical world, not only working in the digital realm. If you take a look at what has been happening in the field of robotics these last couple of months, there is so much progress being made because of the integration of these generative AI, mo AI models. And it's not only big research institutes and organizations that are actually doing this work. You have a large community of tinkerers, of open source developers that are constantly trying to improve the available models that are trying out new combinations. And if you take something like a large language model, which is GPT or chat GPT, and combine that with robotics, you might be able to see something like this uh, at your work in the near future as well. Great. So based on the scene right now, where do you think the dishes in front of you go next? The dishes on the table, like that plate and cup, are likely to go into the drying rack next. Great. Can you put them back? Of course. So what you're seeing here is a multimodal model, which is able not only to um, receive text or speech, it can only see because it can actually parse images and it can actually analyze what's around it. And then it can control the robot. And through this symbiosis, I think, we will see not only automation of knowledge work, which is very new for all of us, but also improvements in the field of uh, manufacturing automation. There are many studies that show that generative AI, such as GPT and ChatGPT, can improve our work, can make us more productive, and that the happiness of those that are actually using these tools is actually increasing. But still, it's a very new technology, and it's not only positives that we see here. There are some downsides to it, and there are things that these tools can't yet do. If you think back about how this works, it's a probability that is calculated, and then one token is put after the next, which means that the model doesn't really know the difference between truth and wrong ideas. It might be that you ask a question, you get a, an answer that sounds incredible, but it's false because the model doesn't really differentiate it. Just try, tries to answer in the way that it was trained to. These, uh, these so-called hallucinations are one aspect that we kind of have to work with. We have to find ways how to keep them at a minimum. And if you just don't think about stuff like that, you might do something like Chevrolet, for example, put out a chatbot based on GPT uh, without thinking too much about the potential uh, security risks, uh, about uh, misuse potential, and then one of your customers might be able to buy uh, uh, one of your cars for $1 because it just convinced the model to answer him, yes, I'm going to sell you the car for $1. Or you could ask the bot to write you a Python script so you don't have to pay for the ChatGPT subscription. We've talked with a lot of companies already. This topic is very interesting to most companies. And the question is not where generative AI will actually help you. The question is, what is the 
what is your current biggest problem and could generative AI help you improving in that area? Because it's going to be different for each company. It's going to be specific for each company where we can actually employ these models and how we have to set up the environment, what interfaces we'll need and how we can integrate that into our daily workflow. So in summary, the speed of innovation that we're currently experiencing is faster than anything I've ever witnessed before. And I've always been interested in technology, but this is just next level. And these tools that can help us get more stuff done, be more efficient, more productive. And the nice thing is they are very, very accessible. Something like ChatGPT or Microsoft Copilot, Google Gemini, they are accessible. You can try them out, not necessarily with sensitive data, maybe, but you can try them out with certain use cases that you find interesting. And if you haven't experienced what these models can do yet, then you don't really know what is possible. And for your companies, it's important that they think about how they can incorporate these technologies into daily work activities, because prohibiting it is not going to help anyone. What that does is people are still going to use it, but they're not going to talk about it. There are studies on that, and it's happening all over the world. People are using it because it's just such a nice tool that can help us in so many ways. So talk to your colleagues, talk to your supervisors, try to find solutions. There are free and open source models available that you could host on your own sites. There are models available through Microsoft Azure, for example, where you have control over your data. There are many different possibilities. Prohibiting that and not using that is not an option. We have to know the limitations of the technology, of course. It's not yet at a point where it can solve every problem and every task, and it might never be. I can't look into the future, but I'm still very positive that this technology will help us uh, innovate so much faster and solve some of the big challenges that we are currently facing in the world. And one thing that will be very, very important in the future is the ability of critical thinking. Because if you think of a future where many tasks are automated by these tools, we still have to be able to decide if the output is good or not. And we, as humans, have to take the decisions because we are the only ones that can actually take responsibility for the actions. Thank you very much. Thank you, Tommy Falkowski. You asked me before if it's normal that uh, during lunchtime there are so many people. And I said, normally not that much. And now you see there are a lot of people sitting, people are standing on the aisle. So I have the impression you have a talent to break down this complex topic into simple words on a basic level. So thank you very much for that. Um, we have some...